Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so first of all, I want to make clear that I don't necessarily see this book as just a book about the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. I really think it's a book about the nature of science. I mean, the Large Hadron Collider and the physics I do is an example of the kind of science that I want to talk about. But really what I'm trying to do is explain a little bit more um, what, what are the elements, what are the elements of thinking that go into science? That's not to say I don't spend a lot of time talking about the Large Hadron Collider and the kind of science going on there, as well as what's going on in cosmology and dark matter searches, for example. But there's a lot of um, more general elements. Um, and it was funny, because I actually haven't been to politics and prose before, and I thought, is, am I supposed to give a political talk? And I mean, I do speak in prose, so that will, that part I had covered. Um, but but really, I do think even even in that sense, I I just think it's really important for people quite generally to start thinking a little bit more scientifically and to understand really what it means in terms of what the role uncertainty plays in terms of what it means to be right and wrong, in terms of the role creativity plays in in what we do in terms of a lot of things that we don't often associate with science. We often think of it as just something where we sort of plug something in and get the answer. But there's a lot more going on than that. And when science is actually happening, um, there's a lot more back and forth that's going on. And understanding the role of uncertainty is, is, is really important, as, as are, are many other aspects of what I'm going to talk about. But because it's only a short talk, and we don't have time to do the entire book, um, I actually have uh, two different talks that I've been giving or that I'm going to be giving. One is more about the Large Hadron Collider and the physics happening there. But another is about one of the concepts that's really important in physics, and that is the concept of scale. And so I'm going to begin the talk um, by talking about scale. And in the process, we'll see some of the exciting physics along the way. But keep in mind that really what I want to get across is why thinking in terms of scale is important, not just for physics, but for all of science, and really qu quite more generally. So with that, I will actually begin the actual talk. And again, thank you for having me here. So um, the title is Knocking in Heaven's Door. I think uh, if my friends polled or enemies polled. Uh, nine out of 10 people like the title. Um, so some of the people think that I'm trying to jump across. But really, what I wanted to get across with the title is, is really what we're doing. I wanted a way to convey the fact that we sort of have this very established base of knowledge, but we're really trying to go beyond it. We're trying to probe those edges. So we're trying to get, get bef beyond that, and that's what science is doing. It's always trying to get a little bit beyond. So that's really what I had in mind. So when I say how physics and scientific thinking illuminate the universe and the modern world, I have in mind just that, that it's really both physics that's relevant, of course, for understanding the nature of our universe, but scientific thinking it has much more broader applications, and it's worth for people understanding. So I'm just going to be begin with a quote from a song uh, of Suzanne Vega. Um, What's so small t to you is so large to me. Um, last things I do, I will make you see. So I guess that's the goal of my talk. <laughs> um, to so part of what I'm talking about is why um, these very small objects that we'll see get studied in the kind of physics I do, I'm a particle physicist primarily, um, why those objects are relevant to understanding the nature of the world, but also why focusing on, on small issues can sometimes just illuminate some bigger, bigger thing, and how to separate out those two. So I'm going to just start with a nice photograph someone gave me, a nice um, photograph from, from Paris, as you might have guessed. Um, and you can tell because it has a lot of iconic Paris features. It has the Eiffel Tower um, in the background. It has, an, it has a kiosk with an affiche on it, um, advertising um, performance. And um, it has, uh, unlike midnight in Paris, it actually has cars in the street which is very typical. So it's kind of a typical Paris scene. So w what do I want to get across here? Well, the thing I want to get across is what you see depends on how you look at things, what resolution you have, what scale you choose to focus on. So if you think about the Eiffel Tower, you can look at it um, from very far away, in which case, if you, ha if you just had a map of France, you'd hardly notice it was there. You cl clearly would not, that would not be a way to know about the Eiffel Tower. You, you wouldn't know of its existence. In the same way, there's many aspects of physics that we don't know about until we really zoom, zoom in to that scale. And of course, I could look very close, and then I would see nothing that conveys the, the sort of beauty and elegance of the entire Eiffel Tower. I would, I would see the grid of the ironwork. I'd be able to study the detailed structure. But if I wanted to study the Eiffel Tower, there's an appropriate scale for that. 
And when I use that appropriate scale, I don't necessarily want to take into account all the little details. I mean, of course, I could zoom in even closer into that iron and look at atoms and molecules, but that's not relevant. That's not what I'm thinking of when I think of the Eiffel Tower. I'm thinking in a particular scale. Okay. But what I really wanted you to see in that slide, which is, of course, much more important, is that if you zoomed in on the affiche, you would see my name on it. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to spend the talk doing is getting you to the point of understanding how my name, I'm a particle physicist, ended up on an affiche in, in Paris. <laughs> It's washed out by the lights, but um, if you look right here, that's my name, Lisa Randall. <laughs> okay. So we'll come back to that at the end of the talk. But for now, let's just think about scale, because I think it's a really important concept. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to focus on this was when I uh, talked about warp passages. Um, I think a lot of people, even those who are extremely interested in the kind of science I do, I think there's kind of a misconception sometimes about how does this relate to the kinds of things we see. There's sort of these exotic ideas of extra dimension, but, but how, does the, how can there be a continuous transition from these very exotic ideas that apply, say, at very tiny scales um, and what we see on human scales? And our intuition is, of course, guided by what we see on human scales. Um, when we think that to, when we think of um, other types of physics, a lot of people think it's almost m magical or it's not real because it's not what they see in their daily lives. But of course, anyone who's seen an optical illusion knows that you can't always trust your eyes. In fact, what you can trust are things that you can measure and record and make many measurements of and do it consistently and get the same answer. And it might not be what's intuitive in the sense that it isn't what you see every day when you walk down the street. But that doesn't mean it's not there. It just means it's not obvious to us as human beings. And I think that's really important to get across, that the physics is describing the world, whether or not we as human beings see it obviously. And our challenge is to, is to get that information out, to be able to interpret um, things that you can make as technology advances to understand what's going on. So what I'm saying in this slide is that our vision, uh, has, you know, there's a visible light spectrum. It's uh, relatively narrow. And of course, if you go to scales, that are smaller than, than the few hundred nanometers that we're talking about, um, if you go to scales that are smaller than that, you, you're not going to be able to literally see something, right? Your visible light is not going to have the sensitivity to, to see things. So that means when we see things at particle colliders, or, we're not seeing it in the way we traditionally do. It has to be something that we would consider a more indirect measurement. And actually, the history of measurement going from direct to indirect measurements is really interesting. Even um, at the time of Galileo, when he had his telescope and microscope, that's the first time people were really using lenses as an intermediate device, not having their eyes directly. Even the precision measurements that were made before were not um, using intermediate devices. And since then, we've had more and more distance in some sense from what we see, but there's nonetheless a very rigid uh, connection between what these devices are measuring and what we see. And in fact, the physical universe involves an enormous range of scales, far greater than, say, the millimeter to the kilometer that we can sort of wrap our heads around. There's many different scales and there's many interesting things happening on them. So first, w before I uh, go on, I just want to take a, a very brief tour of the scales just so we can set the landscape, know, know what, we're, what we're talking about. So of course, we could start at very large scales. Now in principle, uh, scales could be infinitely large. We have no idea how big it is. But we can sort of set a size to it by talking about the size of the, of the known universe, the, the visible universe, the universe that we can see given the speed of light and given the length of time the universe has existed. And that's um, up at the top, and that's about 10 to the 27 meters. Now when you talk about the universe, you have to be a little careful because there's two ways things can be smaller. One is that you could be looking back into the earlier universe. And so I have on that slide the universe when um, some radiation was emitted, which when it was smaller. But of course, we have many objects in the sky, and those objects uh, are of various sizes. We could talk about galaxies. We can talk about the solar system. We can talk about the Earth's orbit, sun. Um, there's many different sizes, and it's, and it's spanning a huge range of scales. One thing that's really interesting, though, about all these scales is that it's really the same laws of physics that are applying over those scales. We're not, we're not finding that we need to adjust the laws of physics as we go to different scales. I mean, if we go to high density, we might need to use general relativity, but basically we're using the laws of gravity, the laws of electromagnetism that we're all familiar with. Um, it's a little bit different in principle as if you look at smaller scales, because 
we, we think of going out big, but you can also go inside. Now, of course, a lot of that is much, much harder to actually visualize. It's much harder to visualize these small scales, and that is the challenge to me as a writer, to try to convey what's going on in, on these small scales, because it isn't as intuitive, and so you need ways to think about it. But what's also interesting is that you can see, you're going, you, you actually vary the scale, you sort of have human scales that we're familiar with, but then you get to scales where atomic physics is a better description, or quantum mechanics might be a better description at those scales. So you've really changed the nature of the way you're going to describe things from using classical physics to quantum physics. And so one thing I want to get across is what that means. Does that mean one is right and one is wrong? What's, what's going on there? And just one scale I want to really focus on here um, is the scale for Large Hadron Collider measurements. Um, if you're wondering what that is, there's a big ring underneath the ground. We'll come back to that later. And that is kind of the frontier scale in terms of what we can actually look at with experiments. That is the frontier energy scale for experiments, and that is 10 to 19 meters, 10 to minus 17 centimeters. That is small, far smaller than anything we could imagine actually seeing. Nonetheless, we are about to learn about those distance scales from the high energy experiments that are being performed there. Um, in, the, in this plot, or, or in this chart, I also talk about some other scales. Now, those scales are even smaller than the scales the Large Hadron Collider can explore. There are many smaller scales that you can think about. Those are not being experimentally explored any time in the near future, as far as we know. Nonetheless, there could be very interesting physics that's happening there. And in fact, there's probably even a limit uh, to the scale that we can talk about, to the distant scales that we can talk about. And I'll come back to that later. So there's this enormous range, um, even below what we're probing. So we're probing this incredibly small scale right now, 10 to 19, minus 19 meters. But that's not even um, near the end of, of scales that we might, in principle, explore. So one question we want to keep in mind is, how can we talk about things with all these unknowns? How, how can we do our physics with all this stuff not yet known? So there's a few things that are striking there. I mean, one is that that's a lot of information. We're covering 62 orders of magnitude and scale. How can we wrap our head around that? How can we keep track of everything that's going on? That's a lot of information. And furthermore, we saw that different physical descriptions enter. We said that we're using classical mechanics for some scales, we're using quantum mechanics at other scales. Um, if we had really kept going down in scale, we might need to have something called quantum gravity, which could combine together quantum mechanics and gravity in a more uh, way that would work over the entire range of scales. So what's going on? What do we mean by this? Um, so we really want a theoretical tool for organizing our information, and that's what we as physicists do. We have a, t a, a tool for organizing information. It's known as an effective theory. So I want to get across to you what I mean by an effective theory. So what do we mean? Well, the solution sounds kind of obvious in some sense. Um, there's all this stuff out there, but let's just keep track of what we need to keep track of. Let's keep track of the effective quantities relevant to observations. That is to say, if I can't measure something, maybe I don't have to use that in my description. Maybe it's, I can just absorb it, sort of um, bundle it up into the quantities that I can measure. And that turns it into a tractable, tractable problem, so that where you don't get caught with unnecessary details. So I think this is kind of a generally obvious concept that you're using all the time without even realizing it. Um, you know, if you, if you want to find politics and prose, well, if you're starting from sufficiently far away, you might want to first find Washington, D.C. So you might have a map where politics and prose is not showing up on the map on the left. Um, so, so that's a very different scale that you're looking at there than when you're looking on, on the right-hand side when you want to know what to do when you're on military road. So you, what, you, what you want to do, you focus in. So in some cases, you're going to keep track of each individual street. But in that description, you're not keeping track of each individual street. You're just keeping track of sort of the larger, more global structure. And that's how we can, that's how we can do it. If we, had a, if we tried to find a way across the country using a street map, of course, that would be kind of impractical. But nonetheless, we all know we can get there using the map on the left, and then when we need to, zoning in on the map on the right. And I think, I'm sure many of you come from different backgrounds. Um, and it's a very general way of thinking, right? You identify the scale for the problem at hand. Um, if you're doing literature, you know, you might do very close reading where you focus on the individual words and what's going on there. Or you might just focus on the big picture, the big story. Uh, in biology, I mean, that we're now seeing that 
some people will do molecular biology, but then you have to integrate that information into some sort of larger, bigger picture. Um, so you might have some sort of system biology and psychology. In every, in every kind of mode of thought, you might focus in on these individual elements or you might try to put it together in this big picture. And it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> We're thinking about what's going on in the world today. So let's just take a physics example, the simplest physics example. Suppose I throw a ball and I want to figure out where that ball lands. I'm not going to think of the ball in terms of its atomic structure, and I'm certainly not going to worry about the quarks and the electrons that are inside. I'm going to think of it as a ball. And that works, and that worked fine for Newton. And actually, that's the way physics works. You're doing effective theories without even knowing it. I mean, Newton didn't say, I'm going to be very clever and ignore all the quantum mechanical structure that's hidden inside. I mean, he just figured out what would happen if you threw a ball. And the measurements that were made at the time would never be able to distinguish the fact that it was a ball from the fact that there's atomic structure. So it would be completely irrelevant. To, so even now, even now, when we know of all this underlying structure, we don't use it when we calculate the trajectory of a ball. If we have a problem involving atoms, we're going to certainly use quantum mechanics. But we're not going to be using it for calculating the trajectory of the ball. It just doesn't make a difference. So in some sense, both theories are correct. You can say that quantum mechanics is the more fundamental theory that is really what's going on. In fact, in principle, um, classical physics is an approximation of quantum physics. But in some sense, it's entirely correct for the uses that you would want to do. I mean, you could stand a man to the moon using classical physics. You, so it, it works. It's effective. And if you don't actually measure anything that tells you the difference, then you're not going to need to use it. But of course, the history of physics is making progress. So what happens is you finally come to a point where it breaks down, where, where you do need to do something different, and that's how you advance. So what happens when you do that is the old theory gets absorbed into the new theory. It's not necessarily wrong, but it won't apply over the entire regime of parameters that you can think about. And that's really how it works. And, what's, and, and in this, what's important is, is stating when you make a measurement what is the accuracy with which I've made that measurement and over what regime does it apply? Because it's, that in, it's that, the little uncertainty that's left over where there's room for something new. And if you don't have the measuring tools, if you're not looking at those scales, you might not care. But at some point, you're going to get there, and then you can find out something new that's going on. And that's the way physics progresses. And I want you to think of the physics we're doing today in that context. So this is what I just said, that distance, in this case, scale, distance scale, is essential as an organizing tool. It's the way we can make calculations. I mean, again, you would never want to calculate the trajectory of a ball based on atomic physics. You'd never, you'd never get it. You'd never get the answer. Um, so, so as I said, the effective theory idea is really the key to progress. And that's always what we kind of have in the back of our mind. I mean, actually, everyone is using effective theories all the time. It's just physicists give it a name, and we know we're using it. And it helps, and, and because for physicists, it's really a very systematic thing. We can say exactly what the uncertainty is, what that allows. We have a, a finite number of parameters. We can make predictions f within an effective theory, and we can also tell when it's going to break down. So it's a very systematic way of doing what we all do intuitively. Okay. And as I said, sometimes the theory at the smaller scale is known in which case you might be able to derive what's in your effective theory from more fundamental physics. And sometimes it's not, and you can just work in terms of those quantities themselves. So you always want to keep the old ideas as long as they're correct. I mean, sometimes things could just turn out to be wrong. But if you have some ideas that have been established over time that make many successful predictions, they are right in a sense. And then you can advance when you find something new, when they cease to apply, in this case, say, at smaller distance scales. So we said atoms inside a ball, but of course, even within the atom, and this is also an excuse to go make sure everyone knows what's inside an atom, um, you find smaller structure. So when you probe inside an atom, you find that it, despite its name, it itself is not fundamental. Of course, we know it's made of nuclei with electrons going around it. And those nuclei are not fundamental either. They're protons and neutrons, and those protons and neutrons are not fundamental. There are objects called quarks, which are inside, which are inside the, the proton and neutron. And those quarks are held together through a force known as a strong force, and that's, that's what we have when we have a proton or a neutron. Okay. 
And I just want to point out a quote. When I first, when I wrote my first book, I realized I didn't actually read many of these kinds of books. So I thought maybe I should glance through a few of them to see what people do. So I looked at uh, one book by George Gamo, and it was really funny because it was written in 1947. It's a very good book, but there's a fantastic quote in it. Um, and I'll, I'll let you think about it for a minute to see why it's so fantastic. As it says, instead of a rather large number of indivisible atoms of classical physics, we are left with three essentially different entities, protons, electrons, and neutrinos. Thus, it seems we have actually hit the bottom in our search for the base, basic elements of which matter is formed. Okay. So I hope some of you see the iron in, in this quote. I mean, they had just discovered these new underlying elements, and they thought, okay, we have the answer. Somehow we found the smallest scale. And, um, and it's very unlikely, I would say, that any of us are living at the time when we really got to all the answers and that we, we end. Um, as we've developed tools to look inside, um, we find that there's new structure, and, and that's, that keeps happening. It, it would be rather incredible if we had found the bottom. And, um, so if I, find, I do find it ironic that at a time when he was so excited about having found this new structure, he could, he could dismiss the idea that there could be further structure that we just didn't have the tools yet, he didn't have the tools yet to find. Um, and of course, as we know, I mean, not only are there neutrons, but there's also quarks that are inside, as we just discussed. Um, and in fact, quarks were kind of interesting because they were actually theoretical motivations for them, but then they were verified by experiment. And again, that's the other important thing that I think gets lost because this physics seems so remote. Even though it sounds so abstract, we really believe it when there's a connection between the theory and the experiment. And we really have a unifying framework, economical unifying framework, for which we can make many predictions that work. And that's what the standard model of particle physics does. It tells you about quarks, uh, particles like the electron called leptons, and the forces through which they interact. And there are many ways it's been tested at a very high level of precision. And what we're looking now is to go beyond it. So how do we go beyond it? Well, we're at the frontier energy scale now. This is where we're looking at something called the Large Hadron Collider, LHC. Okay, large means large. Um, hadron is, is a general name given for objects that interact via the strong force, like protons. And it's actually colliding together bun bundles of protons at very high energies. And it is colliding them, and that's why it's a collider. So it's not a very pretty name, but um, it is the name. And it's the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. And so what you have is this huge underground tunnel. Actually, there's a f um, 27 kilometers in circumference. And there's actually a, a few rings. So I think the protons get accelerated in successive ways. And then they finally collide together at hot, really high energies in this collider. And it really, um, in my book, I joke that I don't like to use superlatives, but you sort of are forced to use superlatives when you're talking about the LHC. Because it really is the highest energy machine. It's the highest intensity machine. Um, everything that went into it, it's the coldest extended place on Earth. It has an amazing vacuum. Everything about it is reaching extremes to try to get to as high energies and as high intensity as, as we can do with the available technology on an industrial scale. So I'm just going to show you a little bit about what happens just through a little video. So this is, so there's, it comes in a linear accelerator, then it goes around some other rings, then it goes around the LHC ring. Then the protons are going to go down this tunnel. And this tunnel you can actually walk around. I mean, I have walked around it. You cross the French-Swiss border if you're in the right place. And you go into, and here the protons enter in a collision region. And around the collision regions, not surprisingly, they have experiments. And when those protons collide, they go outward through the experiment. and so the various layers that, as you go out transversely, are measuring various aspects. And so not only is the LHC an amazing machine, but within it there are amazing detectors. Um, the ones that I'm most interested in are known as ATLAS and CMS. Those are what are called general purpose detectors. The idea is that if there's something new, they're going to find it no matter what it is. So they have different layers to measure as much as possible about these particles, to measure charge, to measure momentum, to measure energy, to measure whether it interacts via the strong force, and that's what these detectors do. So we're very excited about what's going on there. And that is, this is the frontier energy scale. We know about the standard model. We're trying to answer some questions that go beyond the standard model. What are those questions? What do we think we might learn there? Um, well, one of the things that we're pretty sure we will learn is how do particles acquire mass, fundamental elementary particles acquire mass? Now, that probably sounds like a very strange thing. We think of things as just having mass. But it turns out that in the theoretical description of these particles, 
If you didn't have this extra mechanism, which you might have heard of called the Higgs mechanism, named after the physicist Peter Higgs, if you didn't have that, if you just wrote down the theory with massive particles, you would make nonsensical predictions at high energies. It just wouldn't make sense. The theory can't possibly be just that simple theory with these fundamental masses. There has to be something more interesting going on, and that more interesting thing is called the Higgs mechanism, um, which I'm not going to explain in detail here, but I have a whole chapter in the book where I really explain what it means in terms of particles acquiring mass. Um, in addition to that, there's another puzzle, which is, okay, particles get their mass, but why are the masses what they are? What sets the scale for those masses? In fact, it's a real puzzle if you just use quantum field theory, which is what we used that combines together special relativity and quantum mechanics to do particle physics, is what we do and we believe it's right. But if you were to calculate how heavy you think these masses should be, you would find that there's a discrepancy of 16 orders of magnitude. So to make the theory work, it looks like you have to do an enormous fudge, or what we call fine-tuning. Now, um, I mean, I'm glad you're laughing at it, because we think it's laughable, too. We don't think that's really what's going on. We think there has to be some more interesting structure that's there. And that more interesting structure is something I talked about in my previous book, War Passages. It could be something, an extension of space-time symmetry known as supersymmetry. Or it could be something as exotic as an extra dimension of space. I mean, we could be finding evidence of that if it does ex answer this question of why masses what are what they are. It should have testable consequences at the Large Hadron Collider. So those are those two things we really think it's going to do in particle physics. One is understand this Higgs mechanism, what it is that implements it. Is there a particle known as the Higgs boson, which has been in the news a little bit lately? And also, what is it that gives particles their mass? It seems that it, it's very likely to be something rather interesting. Um, and the, the consistent series we, we have thought of certainly have these very interesting aspects that could tell us more about the nature of space-time. The other thing it might do at the, we might do at the Large Hadron Collider is learn about the nature of dark matter. That's not necessarily true, but it does turn out. So what is dark matter? Dark matter is matter. It's stuff like we have. It, it um, aggregates. Uh, it clumps. Um, but it doesn't interact with light. So it interacts gravitationally, but not with light, which of course makes it hard to see. Um, we call it dark matter, but it's really transparent matter because we do see dark things. They absorb light. So dark matter really doesn't interact with light at all. That is the distinguishing feature of dark matter. Nonetheless, maybe it has a little bit of interaction with the stuff we see. And in fact, there's a compelling reason to think that if it if it's a, has a mass, that we're talking about, for, that the LHC is exploring, where particles acquire their mass, it looks like you might have the right amount of dark matter. And right now, there's experiments out there that are looking for that kind of thing, that are looking for dark matter that has the mass that's being explored at the Large Hadron Collider. So the Large Hadron Collider has the potential to tell us quite a bit about the nature of what's out there. And also, it's not just looking for particles, it's really looking for forces and description. It, it could be something much more interesting. What are the fundamental interactions that govern the operation of our universe. But of course, many of you have also heard about other questions. And I want to emphasize, these are questions that won't necessarily be explored at experiments. In fact, we don't know how to explore them at experiments in most cases. But, but people nonetheless are studying it through theory. And one of the questions is, what would be a consistent theory to combine together quantum mechanics and, and gravity? Now, I say it's a theoretical puzzle for the following reason. Any of the experiments we do, we can do without answering this question. Again, we we'll go back to the effective field theory idea. String theory is not necessarily having any impact on, the, on the, any experiments we're doing because it's this fundamental underlying structure that we're not yet measuring. None, so that means that we can use quantum mechanics. We can use relativity to, to predict things depending on whether we're looking at large or small scales. It's only when we were get to these very, very tiny distance scales, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, which is a, far beyond the 10 to the minus 17 centimeters even the LHC is exploring. Or we get to enormously high energies that you would need to really know the answers to these questions if you were to do an experiment. Nonetheless, the fact that we don't know how to make predictions there tells us at least that there is a theory that underlies what we see. So it's still a puzzle. There's definitely a question to be answered. But it's not a question that will necessarily have effects at the experiments we're doing, which is, in fact, 
And in fact, it's this very invisibility which makes it hard to see. The fact that an effective theory can't tell the difference if it's fundamental strings or fundamental particles, that means that it's hard to measure. But it also is why we can go ahead and do an experiment, experiments and f interpret them in terms of our effective theory, which you all understand now. And I'm just going to mention for the fun of it that it even seems like there could be a final short distance frontier since we've explored all the distances. Um, it looks like there, at this point, there is a distance scale known as the Planck scale, this 10 to minus 3, three centimeters. We're, and, and it's often the scale you hear associated with quantum gravity with string theory. But it's also, we don't even know in principle how to go, even if I were to do a thought experiment, if I asked, how can I make a measurement at a scale smaller than the scale, the Planck scale, how would I do it? Ordinarily, when we think about going to small distance scales, we think about going to high energies. Why do we do that? Because if you think of a high energy wave, it oscillates a lot, right? It has a very short wavelength if you have a high energy wave, because there's many oscillations. So if you have a short wavelength, you can probe small structure, because so you, you need some variation on a scale in order to be able to probe that structure. If you had low energies in a big wavelength, you wouldn't be able to measure anything within it. So generally, we think that by going to high energies, we can probe short distance structure. At the Planck scale, that breaks down. And it breaks down for a very interesting reason. If you were to go to a high enough energy to be able to probe smaller than the Planck scale, you've already put so much energy inside such a small scale that you would have a black hole. And if you have a black hole and you add more energy, it just gets bigger and bigger. So even in principle, even in a thought experiment, we don't know how to really study those short distances. So it's not relevant to anything going on today, but it's a very interesting thing that it seems that there is actually a limit, or there could be a limit to where, where we would actually talk about space in conventional terms. I figured completing the story of scale, I should tell you that little nugget. But let's just come back to what we're doing today. Uh, we know how the standard model works. But we expect there's more that lies beyond. There are these questions we don't have answers to necessarily. How do particles acquire their mass? Why are the masses what they are? Um, so we hope that by th studying at higher energies a new regime we have not yet explored, and at greater precision, reducing uncertainty, we'll be able to see these little telltale signs that tell us what lie beyond the standard model. So we use effective theories at the, what's known as the TEV scale. That's the scale that the Large Hadron Collider is exploring. It's, TEV has to do with electron volts. It's a funny unit of energy that particle physicists choose to use. Um, and maybe we'll find this more fundamental description. Maybe we'll find substructure we haven't yet explored. Um, so the challenge is to measure precisely enough that we see the effective theory fail. That's when we really understand the effective theory, when we understand what its true limits are and reveal the more fundamental description or evidence for that. So I'm going to just say one theory that I've worked on. Um, but in order to do that, I just want to tell you a little bit more about scale. I'm not going to go into detail, but I just want to give you a sort of picture of the kind of exciting thing that we might actually hope to learn at the Large Hadron Collider. And then I'm going to go back and tell you why I ended up on the affiche. OK. So the first question, I'm, since we're talking about scale, does anything set scale? Is there an a meaning to absolute distance scale? And Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us how that works. In fact, before Einstein's theory, um, we talked about energy differences. That's probably what you learned about in high school. But the absolute value of energy is important because it tells you about the nature of space-time. And it tells you about the nature of space-time by telling you about the metric. And so let's think about what a metric is. A metric gives meaning to scales. So basically, if you have a ruler, right? If I said something is two apart, that wouldn't mean anything. Do I mean two miles? Do I mean two kilometers? Do I mean two centimeters? What do I mean? So if I have a ruler, it establishes units that I can tell you. So metric sort of tells you what that number means in terms of an actual distance. But there's something else going on when you have the metric. The metric also tells you about the curvature of space, which has to do with angles between things. Um, is it like a sphere? Is it like a saddle on a horse? Uh, is it just flat, like the tabletop? That is also very important information. Now, of course, it's very hard to picture the curvature of three-dimensional space. So I don't recommend you do that necessarily. 
But we can think about what curvature means by going down one dimension and just looking at two-dimensional surfaces, because we can embed them in three-dimensional space and see what it looks like. So you see positively, uh, negatively, and flat surface on, on these pictures. And in that same way, we can have three-dimensional space have curvature. And that curvature is important because it tells us about the nature of gravity. We can think of particles going through a curved space and following the sort of most efficient path within the curved space, and that gives mimics the effects of gravity. So for example, if I had things tunneling in here, if I had something coming in, it would naturally be attracted to the center. So we can understand the attraction, say, of a planet for us in terms of sort of warping the space-time around the planet, for example. So this curvature, so basically energy warps the space or gives curvature to the space, and that curvature tells you how gravity will affect something moving through that space-time. And that's what this is showing. So if you had some, some, some ball, for example, it's going to give us, of course, this is, again, it's a two-dimensional analogy. It's not really what's going on, but it gives you a flavor for what's going on. Because you can imagine that if something were to come through, of course, it's going to be attracted <coughs> towards the center. And how attracted it is depends on how heavy it is. So if you had a very high-mass neutron star, it's going to be curved much more, and it's going to have much stronger gravitational attraction. If you had a black hole, it could be even more. So the thing I'm going to tell you about very briefly, and probably it will be a little confusing because I had to write an entire book to explain it, but I just want to give you a flavor. So what we considered is the idea that there could be not just the three dimensions we know about, but actually an additional dimension of space we don't see. Um, why we don't see it could be many different reasons, but one, probably the most intuitive, is that it, it could be just very tiny. But in this case, space could be so warped, we don't see that additional dimension. Nonetheless, it could have physical effects on our universe. And in particular, it could tell us something very interesting about gravity. It could be that space-time itself is warped or curved in such a way that how you measure things depends on where you are. And that's why I want to s talk about what scale is. So it could be that things look very heavy, so gravity would have a very big influence if I'm on what's called the gravity brain here, but if I move through the extra dimension, it could be that the scale changes. That's what the metric can tell me. And that's actually what we, Raman Sundram and I found. We just solved the equations of general relativity in this context of having an extra dimension beyond what we see and three-dimensional worlds at the end of it. So those, those brains at the end, their brain stands for membrane. It's, so it's a lower dimensional surface in higher dimensional space they could be bounding an extra dimension, and it could be that we live just on the weak brain, so of course it looks three-dimensional to us, but gravity could extend throughout the other dimension. And that fact could explain why masses are what they are, because it could be we are living in the portion of extra-dimensional space where masses would end up being what they are, and not this much bigger value that we think we calculate when we use quantum field theory. Um, it should be confusing. So don't feel badly if it's, if it's confusing. But it's a very exciting possibility that's allowed when we consider the gravity of extra dimensions. The thing I want to emphasize here is that as exotic and as um, crazy as this idea might sound, because it is answering this question about mass that the Large Hadron Collider is exploring, we really have a chance of knowing whether this is right by doing measurements at the Large Hadron Collider, even something as exotic as this warp dimensional theory. Um, and this is just to say, why did we even bother considering extra dimension in the first place? You might ask that. Why, why we even got there? And one reason is just um, the spirit of inquiry. I mean, if you have a baby in a crib, they sort of explore their two dimensions, but then um, my older sister would always try to cl climb out of her crib because uh, they want to explore the third dimension. I think there's a, a lot of nodding heads here. You sort of want to explore those other dimensions. That one's pretty obvious it's there. But there could be even other dimensions, other dimensions we don't see. And we're only going to know about them if we explore them. We don't know for sure. They don't exist. So we can only a a find out if they do by entertaining the possibility they exist and saying what would happen if they did. And in fact, Einstein's theory of gravity works for any number of dimensions. It doesn't only work for three dimensions of space. So we even know how to do the calculations. And it doesn't tell us the answer to how many dimensions there are. Um, another reason is actually string theory. String theory, I said, combines together quantum mechanics and gravity, but it is actually only consistent if there are extra dimensions of space. So if you were a string theorist, you were kind of forced to consider the possibility that there could be these extra dimensions. 
But the other reason is the one I just gave you. It has the possibility of explaining connections among physical parameters in our universe, and that makes it worth exploring. Maybe it's so hard to find the answer. People have been looking for the answer to this question about mass, and, and smart physicists have been looking for this answer for a few decades now, and we don't know what it is still. There's no theory that obviously is so simple and beautiful. And if you, so it was worth considering a slightly more exotic possibilities. And then telling the experimenters how to look for it. That is one of the role we as theorists play. We can say, if this were the answer, this is what you should find. And these experiments of the Large Hadron Collider are tough. So it's very good to have targets and to say what it is that they want to look for. And this is, again, the idea that gravity could be very strong on the gravity brain and very weak on the weak brain where we live, and you know that because my cousin is there. So this is where we live. And gravity could be much weaker than it is on the gravity brain. And here's the experimental signal, just to tell you I'm not cheating you. There could be particles that actually travel in the extra dimension. Now, we don't see an extra dimension, so what would we see? Well, what we would see are particles that have properties of ones that we know about, but they would seem to have bigger mass. Because we would interpret this momentum of the extra dimension as mass, because we don't actually see the dimension. So what the experiments are actually looking for are particles that have properties like the ones we know about, but they're heavier. So they're looking for heavier particles. And if you ask how heavy they should be, again, this is just the right mass for the Large Hadron Collider to explore, because it is answering these questions about particle masses we know about. So in this particular scenario, if it is answering this question, the Large Hadron Collider should find these particles known as Kaluza-Klein particles, KK particles. So these are a lot of ideas. That's a lot of stuff. Um, and, but I think, for me, it was important to say how these sort of more conceptual ideas about scale, about being what right and wrong, the role of uncertainty, combine together with what we're doing all the time when we're actually doing science. I think it's really important. And maybe we'll even show it to be real, and it certainly is the food for her creative endeavors. But I thought I'd end the talk by talking of other applications of these ideas in art projects, because it was a lot of fun. And I actually think it's, it's a good time to be thinking about the intersection of art and science. And I don't think all of it is great. There's, some of it is terrible. But some of it's really interesting. Because what, what does art do? It sort of absorbs the culture of the time. And there's all these really interesting scientific ideas. And it's really interesting to do them. So I'm just going to briefly mention a gallery show that I co-curated with Leah Halloran. And also, I'm going to come back to that affiche that I mentioned in the beginning. Okay. So. So the, the show we did was called Measure for Measure, and here was the idea that we had. So a lot of the time art and science intersects. You either take art and you try to make some science thing look artistic, or you try to take some science idea and turn it, or some artistic idea and say, is there any science in it? And that, that's really hard. But what if you just took a theme that both artists and science could think about? And scale is certainly one of them. I mean, it's very central to the way artists are thinking. And it's very central to the way scientists are thinking. So, we, so what we worked with the Los Angeles Art Association, we put out a call for proposals. And we asked them to try to incorporate some of the ideas that an artist would think, but also what a scientist would think about. And for a scientist, one of the really important ideas was that idea we saw earlier, that if you look at small scales, things can look very different than they do on large scales. And when I look at this table, I don't see atoms. I don't see quarks. I see a table. Yet if I were to able to probe inside, I would see something very different. So I'm just going to give you a couple of samples briefly of wh what people came up with. So one is just actually just looking at the tree itself. This is what Barbara Promet did. She said a tree, but if you look at that bark on the right, of course, it doesn't really look give you the feel of that large sequoia tree, sort of like the Eiffel Tower when I started off. Um, I just like showing this because I think it's, it's fantastic. Um, Susan Ferroni actually just went and carved old, old books, so she had Alice in Wonderland. She took books that had something to do with scale, Gulliver's Travel, Alice in Wonderland. And she's actually carving the pictures, like cutting them out so that they become one big thing. So you have this thing that's in an integrated um, union of all the little pictures. So again, you have these individual pictures, but then it turns into something very different when it's all put together. And I'll just show one more with the Katrina McElroy, where it looks like just some pop art thing, but if you actually zoom in close, which unfortunately I don't have here, it is actually pictures of uh, 
to her face. So it almost looks like someone's staring at you if you look close. So you can't see that, but it's all integrated from various features. So again, you, you see something very different if you look at the tiny scale, if you're standing right next to it, if you have the resolution to see that, which we don't in this slide, unfortunately, or if you look on larger scales. And there were a, a number of other pieces of art, too, which were fantastic. But the other thing I want to tell you about is the, um, what we called a projective opera that we had. So hang on a second. So, um, so when I wrote my first book, War Passages, it was about an extra dimension of space, this warped extra dimension of space idea I just briefly outlined. And he read it, and he was a composer who works at IRCOM. And he had wanted to do something about the intersection of art and science. He wanted to use science as a motivation. He does electronic music, and he wanted to motivate sort of expanding his repertoire. So he, he liked the idea of working with his physical theory. And I liked it, and it was, you know, I just finished writing this book where I tried very hard to organize all these ideas into a linear fashion. And it was such a liberating thought to be able to say you could have many different voices, you could have music, you can have art, you can have words, and just try to just give an idea. Of course, you're not teaching a lesson, but to try to give an idea of what this physics is about. But also, as importantly to me, was sort of why are we doing this? What, what, why explore? Why do we think there's more out there? So we ended up writing this small opera that premiered at the Pompidou Center, which is why we had that affiche there. Um, that was about this, this question of, of the difference between someone who thinks they have all the answers, who lives in the three-dimensional world, and someone who thinks there's more, who's a composer, couldn't finish her music, and went out into this higher-dimensional world. So I'm just going to end and, and um, just actually play some of it, because it's kind of fun. Thanks, Lisa. I like artist books, too. Um, in a recent New Scientist, uh, Lisa Grossman talks about uh, the small, unexplored range at the LHC between 115 and 145. You get electron volts. One of these talks, yeah, one's louder. You're talking about the Higgs search. Or, or right. Yeah. Now, if the Higgs turns out not to be there, does that affect your thoughts on uh, <laughs> um, a theory with an extra dimension or two? Um, well, I tr and I, I tried to separate out those issues. I mean, there's two issues that are going on. One is what it is that gives particles mass, and one is, um, so one thing that's interesting, so, le so let me just focus on this issue of the Higgs boson first. What does it mean, so right now people are getting a little worried, or at least they say we're getting worried because we're closing in on the mass range. Actually, that's what the Large Hadron Collider is designed to do. I mean, the Higgs has only one mass if it is out there, and it's supposed to find out what it is. And if you had asked people before they turned on the Large Hadron Collider what they thought that mass would be, most of them would have thought it's this value that has not yet been tested. I think it, without any additional data, they would have said, so if you really believed that was right, you wouldn't be at all disturbed now. You would say, it's not, those are not the masses I thought it should be at, it has, and they haven't explored it yet. Now, why is it still a little bit disturbing? Well, because until we have experiments, no one really knows the answers. So you can say, I think the mass might be 116 GeV. But you know, I could be wrong. And so maybe you know, you'll feel a little safer if there's a little bit of buffer room and there could be more values. The fact is that a lot of those values are, not, are now not possible. So it is zoning in on the region that we think is interesting. And o over the course of the next year, we might actually know the answer to whether that Higgs, the, way, the conventional, the simplest version of a Higgs is there. But one of the things I talk about in the book is why are we doing this search? Well, we don't actually know, even if the Higgs mechanism is right, we don't know what it is that implements that Higgs mechanism. It could be the simplest model that gives the predictions that we can really pr know very well, because the Higgs interacts with mass, so we know its interactions very precisely. It interacts with heavier particles more, for example, because they have more mass. But it could be something a little more subtle that has to do with, that's underlying this Higgs mechanism. And if that is the case, it's not clear that these experiments so far would have been testing it. It could be that it decays into something different. Or it could be that it's heavier, that it actually has stronger interactions. So it could be something different. So we're really, so I, I view it that we're learning about the nature of what the Higgs could be. I mean, after all, right now we can say, I can pretend that the, we, we don't find the Higgs boson and ask what it is that could consistently give particles their mass. And all of us can ask that, and no one has an answer to it. So I think a lot of people really think the Higgs mechanism is right, but the question is what it is precisely that's implementing it. If I could ask another one, in the future, if uh, at some point, I guess the LHC will probably uh, run out of things to look for, but uh, 
what would be the argument for building a larger accelerator such as well, the SSC? For, for, okay, so right now, I myself would feel much more sanguine that we would be able to answer all these questions about the Higgs that you just asked, about the extra dimensions, if we had three times the energy. I mean, it's a very rough argument. We know basically the energy is where things should appear, but we don't know precisely the energy where they should appear. And for us as theorists, a factor of two, it's sort of the same theory. But from an experimenter's point of view, you've gone from a regime where you can definitely find it to a regime, regime where you don't have any hope at all. So the Large Hadron Collider will do a lot of exploration, but it's not clear that it will actually explore everything because you need a lot of energy. And, and what we've seen so far, the, so the Large Hadron Collider, we started making that 25 years ago, quarter, over, over 25 years ago. Since then, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot that seems to point to things being heavier than people might have guessed then. And so that's the argument, that there really could be, the, the real answers might even be a little bit higher in energy. And I'm not just doing a cop-out. I mean, this is, you know, all of it is sort of the same general regime, and it's just technology. As I talk a lot about in the book, it's, it's the size of the tunnel that existed that determined what the energy would be for the Large Hadron Collider. It was as high as it could be, consistent with magnets that have to keep the protons rotating around in those rings. With the SSC, they said, what is the energy, based on theory, what is the energy we really would like to study? And they said, we're going to build a ring that's big enough that with existing magnetic technology, we can get there. So here, we were sort of forced, it was a compromise between what we wanted to do with experiment and, and what we could do um, with technology. And, and so that's the argument, that there could actually be very interesting physics right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a hard time conceptualizing anything as small or short as 10 to the minus 17th or 10 to the <laughs> minus 19th. So what does a physicist think she's looking at it at when, when something is that small in dimension? Well, so I guess the first thing is let's stop using the word look. Um, so because we're not looking, and I tried to emphasize in the beginning, we're not seeing with our eyes. We are making indirect measurements that tell us the properties of what's there. So we can conceptualize it, we can work it out mathematically, I can describe it in words, but that's different than seeing it. And so I think a lot of people tend to think that's the only way you understand something if you see it. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to just have uh, everything be consistent and understand it through, through, through the fact that there are predictions that work, there's a form, formalism that works, there any even words to describe it. So it's only indirect and not something that, that, that the average person is going to think we have to look at. Be able well, to look you're at. wearing glasses. Yeah. Um, so you actually are seeing somewhat indirectly. Uh, and the question is, where do, where do you draw the line? You're talking to me in a microphone. It's a bit indirect. So, you know, so we're, we're used to that. We think, but, but it doesn't mean it's not real. It just means we have to be careful when we interpret it. As we do when we see, I mean, as we know now, as we understand our biology better and better, after all, our eyes are actually, in some sense, a form of technology, too. So it, it's so when we say see, we think of it as something that's just happening. But of course, there's light rays that are going into it. They're getting processed by our brain. There's a lot of processing going on. Some of it's deceptive, in fact. So, so it's it's a little. So we again, our intuition is guided by what we see, and that's what I tried to get at the beginning. But there's a lot of stuff that's out there that's real, that we just don't have in our intuition for. Hi. As the uh, mother of a, um, my daughter who's an engineer and the grandmother of three daughters, uh, one who has already expressed an interest in being a scientist, could you speak to um, women in the field of science and uh, what you, are, are they going into that field in larger numbers and about uh, as a president? I think they're in your family. <laughs> Well, as, as President Obama says, what uh, what do you think is going to be the uh, the outcome if we fail to do more investment in education in science as well as in just research in science as a country? Well, I think, I mean, I think that's an easy question to answer. I think we all know what the failure is, and and we can even figure it out scientifically because we can look around the globe and say, what happens in those countries where they don't invest in science, where they don't invest in education? And I think most of us would not like those results. So I don't think we even have to um, deduce it. In many cases, we can actually do the measurements and see what happens. So I, I, I think it's ex incredibly important that we do that. Um, as far as women, I, I think there are more. I think in physics, it still hasn't 
changed as much as, as in some other fields. Um, and I don't have a, a great answer to why that is. Um, I think, you know, I didn't, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do it. So I was perfectly happy. So I think to the extent that people don't know they're not supposed to do it, that's very helpful. <laughs> as long as you're not properly socialized, you do really well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't really have an answer. How, what would you say encouraged you to go into I liked it. I mean, I was good at it and I liked it. And like I said, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do it, so I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was just wondering, has there been anything that the LHC has show, showed up? Is yeah, there anything up? new that you know now since it started working? Well, mostly what we know is a lot of things are wrong. And this is something that's really important because uh, when, when you do experiments, they, they really do have two roles. I mean, and even Galileo knew when he first started doing experiments, um, they, they show things are right. You can verify a theory. But as important to progress is ruling out theories. In this case, it's not, in some cases, it's actually ruled out ideas. In some cases, it's just ruled out various regimes of parameters, certain masses, certain interaction strains. But all of that is progress, because it's telling you that you can't get away with just anything at all. I mean, the more, so we know a lot more. I mean, it should be borne in mind, and people don't all seem to realize this, the LHC is not running at full energy. It's not running at full intensity now. It's going to close down for a year or so and get up to those parameters. So right now, we're not yet at the energies where we really were completely confident. It's actually remarkable how much it's done, given given the energy that it has and given the way it's going. It's just they're getting more and more events, and they're really the fact that we'll be able to cover the entire Higgs regime is is a real, it, at least as a possibility, is really a surprise in some ways. It's doing incredibly well, and when it comes in at higher energy, then then we really will start looking for discoveries most likely. <laughs> 